Okay, well, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, it's good to see everybody again. And uh, I think we have uh, Jim Atkins and Jay Smith on, on Zoom. Is that right? Are they on yet? Or just to check? Roger that. Roger that. Ten four, good buddy. Uh, I don't see Jim Atkins here okay. yet. Jim, if you join, I could join, and I don't see him on the if uh, so we have quorum so we've got quorum established we can vote well again welcome everybody and uh, as the COVID numbers thank you Jesus are going down in the state hopefully we can continue to, to meet like this and, and, and be in person I think uh, Zoom is great but uh, getting so many stakeholders in the room together I think uh, it's very helpful and all the networking that goes on before and after the meeting is very helpful to get things done as well. So I uh, appreciate everybody being here and taking the time out of your schedule to support uh, the trauma work in Georgia. With that being said, most of us or a lot of us uh, have just completed the three day meeting of TQIP. That's the American College of Surgeons Trauma Quality Improvement Program. It's the, the, the national program. Uh, for trauma quality, the biggest in the country. And uh, when we meet in person, it was all on, it was all virtual this year. Hopefully it'll be in person again next year, but uh, it's about 1500 members uh, across the United States, over 600 trauma centers represented. And that's who we benchmark with uh, for our individual trauma centers. And the commission uh, provides some funds for that. Uh, which is very helpful for us to do our drill downs. And then the Georgia Collaborative, which all the trauma centers are in one, uh, one box, if you will. Uh, and uh, they're listed as the Georgia Trauma Center. Not really on that, but that's what it is. And then we can see how we stack up as a state. So um, with that being said, uh, we had a good presence there. And I'll just uh, sort of jump here in my notes. Uh, on that light, uh, you know, over the years, uh, going back to 2017, when we started looking at things for our state collaborative, our trauma collaborative, which is all the trauma centers together, our mortality was high, uh, uh, our uh, acute kidney injury was high, pneumonia was high, all these things, hospital <coughs> look at, we were outliers on the map. We were sort of red diamonds. And through all the work of everybody in this room, all our stakeholders, uh, that really dramatically got better uh, over the next couple of years uh, until now, at least before this report. Uh, I haven't seen the, the most previous report, uh, but uh, the fall report, we were all black diamond. So uh, Liz, uh, I think Regina worked on that as well, uh, pulled that data together and uh, it was accepted for presentation at the uh, performance improvement section uh, yesterday, actually. And uh, I'm happy to say one first place uh, nationally for, for the work for, for the state. So, uh, so thanks for writing that up and presenting it and uh, kudos to everybody. This is a high five moment for our state. Uh, and from what I understand, uh, yeah, everybody. All departments were acknowledged, you know, as our state collaborative. And uh, uh, I think Liz is starting to get a lot of emails for like, what can we do in our state? How do you do that? And that kind of thing. So, so uh, thank you for doing that. With that being said, uh, TQIP is taking a little bit of a change course. You know, Dr. Dente has been our surgical champion, if you will, uh, helping with uh, some of the, uh, you know, the guidance of that, which has been a, a big job for him. Um, and he and I spoke about a week or two ago, uh, dates get away from me now. And he's going to go, decide to go a little bit different direction with his career and work on some other things. So uh, he is going to step down as the champion uh, for that piece of it. So we've asked Dr. Uh, uh, Rob Todd, who's the senior vice president and chief of acute care surgery at Grady uh, to assume the role. And he's graciously uh, agreed to do that. Uh, Dr. Todd comes with a wealth of experience. Uh, uh, his career has spanned from, uh, from Texas to New York uh, as being trauma directors or critical care director or, you know, just a lot of different roles and understands uh, trauma very well. So uh, he's willing to jump in with Gina 
and I'm sorry I left Gina out there. She was, uh, she's really, you know, the, the linchpin, I guess, that holds the collaborative together and ran the, the collaborative meeting uh, during our lunch meeting uh, a couple of days ago, I guess it was, or maybe it was Monday, Monday, uh, and oversees all the work groups. So uh, he'll be working directly with Gina. And I think those two uh, will really go to the next level uh, with where we need to go. So uh, 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 great days ahead, I think. With that being said, we also, uh, Liz and I are really looking at our trauma commission uh, committee structures. Uh, some of those need to be revamped a little bit about uh, what they do, uh, uh, or what they need to do, or what, what maybe a change of course. So we're reviewing that. We're reviewing the attend, uh, not the attendance, but the, uh, uh, the, uh, the commission members that are on those. Some, we're trying to make sure everyone has an equal uh, uh, load of work. Uh, there are some commission members that are on several committees. There's some that are not on very many committees. So we want to, it's time to, as the new year comes around, to sort of make sure everybody's on a committee uh, and that some one individual is not getting overwhelmed and trying to match skill sets with interest and passion and those kind of things. Uh, so we haven't done that in a while. And uh, we should have that ready, what, you think, the next meeting? Uh, Probably the next we, got, meeting. we got some more work to do. So. So if there's, now's the time to put a bug in my ear. If you're like, I, I hate this committee. <laughs> I want off, let me out, please. Except for maybe you, Vic, you don't get it. But no, if, uh, if you, you want out, now's the time to tap out. Or if you say, hey, I wanna, I wanna come over and Vic's not doing a good job in his committee. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna get on his committee. Now's the time to put a bug in my ear. So, uh, so we're working on that. I pick on Vic a lot. He's he's a good friend. He's good. For me. I like he he takes the he takes the, the jokes well, um, and so I think that covers uh, everything that I need to go over as my chairman's report, and I'll turn it over to our executive director for the administrative report. Okay. Um, do we want to go ahead and approve the minutes? That's what that I would be good. Right. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? Courtney? Courtney, oh, I'm awake. Right. No, I'm just, Courtney is, I, I, I always count on Courtney to pick up anything in the minutes because he, yeah. he is, I'm he good. is, I'm good. he is the guy. I he run is. them through him first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's good. Because <laughs> Courtney doesn't miss a lick, let me tell you. So, I'm just having fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well then I think we should vote unanimously to approve. Okay. All right. I'll just take no since we have two on Zoom. Um, so don't we just have Jay? Jay? Okay. All right, man of Stan Brew. Thank you, Liz. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. Um, and again, I, I just want to reiterate what Dr. Ashley said. You know, we got the idea to kind of put that abstract together about two days before it was due, which is <laughs> the usual fashion that we do things. We go, oh, we should be represented here. Oh my gosh. And then we work until about midnight the two nights to try to push it, push it over the finish line, which we ended up doing. So it represents the work, not just of all the centers, but all the system partners and all the entities that really make that really churn the wheel. So um, I'm so happy that it generated so much interest in folks because we can learn from other folks as well. So I look forward, I already have my first call with Mississippi on Monday morning. So I'm really looking forward to that. Liz, is there any way we, is there any plan to publish that data? To put it in, a <laughs> in my spirit. Time. Sounds like a volunteer. <laughs> So just ask him. Let's put Jim on that. So yes, there is. <laughs> there, there is. So you can be one of the. It probably isn't one of the. Yeah, you know what I think about it. No, no, no. Oh, it's fine. There's already an outline, and most of it's yeah. just fleshing in the details, and all the stakeholders who are involved obviously would get. So put Jim down review. for the work group on that. Yeah. Well, we need to publish it because it's out right. there. We don't want anybody else to get the model published before we do. Right. right. This is really. The Journal of the American College of Surgeons, the Blue Journal. Oh, you think so? I think so, because it's 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 using the American College of Surgeons tool. Yeah. To, so they like yeah. publishing stuff that they can look here. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Also central to the conceptual model is the Donabedian model, which was all over. I don't know if you listened to the fireside chat with Dr. Hoyt and um, 
Dr. Chang, but like, I think that's what drew a lot of attention to it, that it's really built on the, an already widely recognized and accepted um, quality methodology. So, mm -hmm. we, and we yeah. can kind of take it to the next level, so yeah. Uh, but I'm most excited today to welcome our new executive admin assistant, Gabby Say, who put together your lovely packets for today. <laughs> um, she's been a great addition to our small but mighty little team. Uh, so we're really excited to have her and uh, moving forward, a lot of communications will come out um, from Gabby. She's super organized with um, all aspects of meeting coordination, has a lot of experience. I know I mentioned it uh, at the last meeting as we were um, just getting ready to onboard her. So very excited to have her. Um, I also want to say, I'm sure this will come up in Renee and David's report, but I just want to congratulate Cartersville for, uh, Medical Center for being the first ACS verified level three center in our state that is really exciting because um, we're already i think up to nine twos and now we're moving into the realm of threes and uh we're really moving uh forward with that um, national verification piece which is really nice um and then um i think that's it for those updates i'll just Draw your attention to your packet starting on page 12 under your administrative section. You'll just see some items that I've included there. Uh, congratulations to um, Mr. Courtney Terwilliger, Dr. Ashley, and Dr. Medeiros on your reappointments. Whether or not you see those as positive, yes, mm -hmm. we're glad to have you for another tour. Sure, you're still here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then you'll uh, go to the super speeder uh, revenue summary on pages 15, 16, 17, and 18. So we hope that this will be the template that we'll use moving forward because I know while Katie and I look at this all the time, we sort of, you know, the super speeder revenue is kind of how we plan for what we think we're going to be able to present to you in terms of budgeting and, and where we put our money for initiatives. Uh, we want to make sure you always keep in mind year over year revenue, but then when you look at pages 17 and 18, we need to keep track of that from a month to month basis. So in order to have a little bit more perspective, and um, I see Sarah in the audience, this is the same way you would track your volume in your trauma center. So this looks, this looks a lot like how we, you know, how you know how your, how your center's doing. So we want to look month to month. Are we up? Are we down? And you can see in the table on page 18 over in July, we were, you know, 16% under. So we had a real uh, kind of, you know, something to be a little bit concerned about, but we've kind of bounced back. So we want to look at that from a month to month basis, just so we're aware of what is coming in. Also on the topic of super speeder revenue in our new reporting structure up to the governor's office through Kristen Long, who's the deputy COO for the governor. Uh, I learned from her, she actually authored House Bill 511 that we discussed a lot um, uh, throughout the last legislative session. That was the bill that dedicated any, any um, dedicated fees that were out there that were subject to the general um, uh, treasury, the Georgia treasury, were now to be allocated to those um, initiatives in which they were written in code to be allocated to. So the governor signed that. So our trauma fund should be set up by July. This current budget year, the process will be the same for us, but we do anticipate a big change for the FY 2020 uh, for and moving forward because the this um, legislative session will be FY 2023 so we'll still have to go through the same process, but then our funds will not be in the Treasury, they will actually be allocated to us so that is a huge win for us, we were kind of the beneficiaries of that legislation because we weren't the ones that brought it. Say again. Interest yes bearing. interest bearing too yes. Um, so that puts us really in a whole different um, a whole different phase. So just to clarify, that means that all super speeder funds go directly into the trauma fund, correct. along with that, with the the requisite allocation for the fireworks fund. Correct. I don't know about fireworks. Uh, there's a lot to be uncovered about this. Um, I would assume so, but I am awaiting for them to um, provide me guidance. I'm having regular conversations, as I always have with OPB and the governor's office, and so. 
we, I should know more as time unfolds, certainly by next summer. We wouldn't need to be subjected to amended budgets, so the money we get is right up front and we don't have to make those corrections. So this is the last year that and we have to do that, but after that, it all starts flowing. Yeah. Right. But remember, they vote now on 23, so, you know, because we're so early in the process, or they vote on the upcoming session in January on FY23. So 23 is probably going to be the same process, mm -hmm. but uh, as far as amended 23, that might look a little bit different. But, yeah. Yeah. Lots to learn about this, about the logistics of all this. Um, but eventually we won't have to go over January bank for the last right. few million dollars. Please, if we get it up front, where's that money here? There is uh, the, um, the bill that passed that the governor signed had a provision uh, for a trust fund. So that's what Regina was referring to when yeah. she said interest bearing. Yeah. Because we don't get the 21 million up front. It's based on who, who speaks. Right. We encourage people to keep speeding so getting money. <laughs> well, theoretically, if we propose other legislation to support the trauma system, the funds generated from that would again go to that trust fund. So sure. if we decided to embark on the tag fee down the line or something else, those dollars. It, it, it goes into a true lockbox. Did you want to mention the talk to the Georgia Chamber? Because there was interest in, in the, or the timing might be right. Or something. Yeah, I should. Have, yeah, I should have mentioned that. So uh, we were asked, Liz and I were asked to uh, speak to the Georgia Chamber uh, about a month ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, just really a trauma update, and so we didn't really know what they wanted. So you know, we got thousands of slides, so we, we gave them a trauma update. So uh, not a thousand slides, but we picked a few robust slides that uh, really educated on when we're asked to give talks like that what i usually try to do is educate on what what is trauma you know because a lot of people you'd be surprised how many people are not sure exactly what that means what is trauma how it affects them and then you know just sort of walking through those kind of things and we did that and they were very engaged uh we talked a little bit about the funding uh you know how the funding works where we get it and what we do and, and you know we measure quality and just all those kind of things just a general overview and uh they were very receptive and uh, uh, we talked about how you know we needed more funds to for a sustainable system and uh, they were very supportive like yeah i think we should i think we need more funds too so they they said you know, we didn't come in with like in hard deal or anything, but they were very receptive that the trauma system needs more funds and that they, as business leaders, they need to have a good trauma system for their, to recruit business into Georgia and for education and all those kind of things. And so, you know, they, they didn't have any problem with uh, coming up with some kind of sustainable funding source from the legislature, even a $10 tag fee. You know, don't quote me as saying that's what they wanted. That's not what, but we mentioned, you know, we tried that in the past and and talked about some other things and, and they, they thought something along those lines was reasonable to support the trauma system. So I think that's pretty important for us to know coming from the business community, uh, you know, obviously they're not all the business community, but that's some of the key leaders. So anyway, it was a positive response that maybe it's time for us to be talking about those things again with our legislature. Right. Um, as, a, as a chamber of commerce, as a collaborative business entities, uh, this would also be a great source for revenue into the foundation as a, a, as a yeah. Of revenue yeah. Source. That would be very good. And, and many of the people who are participants in the chamber of commerce would also be potentially good for the foundation. It's a really good idea because if you don't have business involved, it's hard for anything to go right. anywhere legislatively. So, I was very pleased with the with the general response. Uh, you know, they weren't opposed, and they saw the need, and they like they they want us to have a good trauma system. So, 
Okay, next in your packets, um, and I'll certainly ask Dr. Ashley and um, Dr. Wallace as our lead of the administrators group to comment <clears throat> on this, but um, shortly after we met in August, um, as you recall, COVID numbers were really reaching a peak that were pushing capacities at uh, places that they weren't seen even in the initial COVID spike. And um, there were reports that some of our even having to go out of state in order to get um, definitive care, which was a frightening thought. So we got uh, all of the CEOs of all of the trauma centers uh, and trauma leaders on a call to kind of talk about how could we mitigate this? What does this look like? What do we need to do? What infrastructure, if any, do we need to build? And how do we create a communication mechanism so that if you take, I think Dr. Dunn and Dr. Ashley and Dr. Medeiros had a great, they're in a region where um, if, if three of them are unable to accept, and this was primarily regard, let me just set the context here, primarily with regard to trauma transfers. So this is an EMS. This is they have a rural hospital that may not be a trauma center. They've got a sick patient that needs to get out and they're having to make a hundred calls because they can't find a place, an accepting place. So in your regions, if all three of you are unable to accept a trauma transfer, there's nowhere for that. I mean, they literally just have to scroll through a list of hospitals or Google. I don't, if you're in a small hospital, I, I don't know how this actually works. Um, and it can delay hours of patients, patients getting out. We heard of like patients with like spleen injuries, bleeding to death, waiting to find a place to go. So we wanted to create a mechanism whereby if the three of them in a similar region, uh, regional catchment area couldn't take a patient, how can they get some kind of buzz that says, okay, none of us have inca inpatient capacity how do we let the other one know? Like, let's round robin this. Like Dr. Dunn takes the first one, Dr. Ashley takes the second one, and then Dr. Medeiros takes the third one. So and then Dr. Ashley texting us at, at 12 o'clock saying, hey, we're going on diversion. It's 12 o'clock a.m. A.m. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Just to, just to we're like, oh, okay, that. wait, we're, are we on? Are we off? We started just texting each other. Yeah. And that's how well, many of we you know, we, we we've off. had this group text <laughs> for a long time. And um, uh, after... The fall uh, national COT meeting, um, where Dr. Stewart mentioned that they just used WhatsApp. They had all the medical directors and TPMs on WhatsApp, and they just let each other know, "Hey, we can't take a patient." I mean, even though COVID numbers now, I just saw that there's some spikes happening out in the Midwest. But you know, even though for us right now, it, it's it's kind of uh, waning a little bit. It's just a matter of time before the next thing comes down the pike that's going to really test our inpatient capacity. And we don't, we still have not built an infrastructure whereby we can communicate. And, and it's, you know, we don't want to say, you know, there's all kinds of people have brought up and talent implications, but the fact remains, if you don't have beds, you don't have beds. And we need to figure, we need to figure this out. We have the brain power. We had a, over 90% participation by CEOs on this call. It was so impressive. So there were a couple items at, at the yes. last minute. We called mm -hmm. two days ago. Oh, we called uh, the day of, I sent out the invite. I sent out the call when you and I spoke to say, this is urgent, we're in crisis, we need your help. And they were on the call the next day. It was very impressive. So there were a couple of key points here that we kind of um, uh, came out with. One was just kind of delineating that trauma transfer diversion thing that we know we really never want to have happen, but we know reality wise, we may be put in that situation again. The other one was this sort of feasibility of a notification system uh, for trauma transfer diversion, and then um, uh, accuracy of making sure that the systems we currently have in place, such as what's in the RCC, that that's accurate and kept up to date and that sort of thing. So any comments from, from you, uh, Dr. Wallace or Dr. Ashley, while on the call? Well, I'll just say how this came about was literally that. So, so, so just so everybody understands what, how it happens in a trauma center. So we never go on trauma diversion at my hospital. Can you, just, can you explain what trauma diversion is? So trauma diversion doesn't mean somebody's shot in the, out on First Street that they don't come to my center because you can't go on diversion for, for making. They're going to come. There's no place else for them to go, basically. So, so uh, but trauma diversion for us is transfers. In other words, I'm not going to take somebody from an hour away 
uh, into my facility because I don't have a bed or I don't have uh, human capita such as surgeons or nurses or whatever. That until COVID, until this summer, this last surge, we'd only been on trauma diversion, transfer diversion for four and a half hours once in 2014. So that gives you an idea. And so we're always overwhelmed. We're, we never have ICU beds. We always have ICU patients holding in the ER. That's just, that's just how we live. And that's how we all live. So that's, that's not uncommon. So because I don't have an ICU bed, we, did, we would never go on diversion almost ever. But when it got so bad that we didn't have ICU beds and we're having to work trauma alerts at the desk in the hallway because we don't even have a closet to put them in, that, that really stressed the system. And so then you, that's when I get the call as the trauma director. And for us to go on a version, it takes the trauma director, the CMO. There's a cascade that just one person doesn't make the thing. So I, the reason I call you all, text you at midnight, because they're calling me at midnight, you know, when I'm not even in the state or somewhere, you know. So and don't get me wrong, I appreciated that text because it helps. No, no, it helps just know that we're going to be getting people coming from Macon, right? Yeah. And so, so when I get the call, they go, we're in crisis. We need to go on diversion, trauma transfer diversion. My first question is, what's Augusta doing? Are they on diversion? What's Savannah doing? And the reason I ask that question is because if you all are wide open and we're overwhelmed, then I know patients are going to have access. It's all about access. So I would reluctantly, you know, yeah, okay, let's go on. Let's get off as soon as we can. But then if they call me back 10 minutes later, they say Savannah and Augusta's on there. Then I have to make a decision as a trauma director. Okay. Who's, who, what, how's the patients going to get hurt the easiest? You know, and that's what I mean. How will they be hurt? Will they be hurt? If I go on, you know, I can't take care of them. I got to work them at the desk. Is that safer for them than not taking them at all? And then the poor hospitals trying to find somebody and send them to Tennessee or send them to Jacksonville, Florida or somewhere. What's the safest place for that? Is it a transport to Jacksonville or is it at my desk with the MR going, wow, what you doing? Yeah. You know, and so, and, and that's how I make the decision. And it, there's no science to it. It's just a gut feel of what's safest for that patient. So when they tell me, you two are on to version two. I'm going to try to hang in the game for a few hours longer, even though it might not be the best thing for that patient. It's not good care, but it's closer than Jacksonville. Uh, so, so that's how I look at it. So then I got to think, because we've been texting back and forth. Are you on? Are you on? So I got to thinking, and what we asked Michelle to help with is, can, instead of us just text, is there some way I can see? Is there some way I could know? Is there some way we can three no, and I'm just taking our region. I could do this all over the state, but I'm just focused on my region. Is there some way that that I can see what you all are doing so they don't have to keep calling you and finding out whether I can stay in the game or not? It's just about working together. And so that's how this all came about. So Michelle, that's- Absolutely. So I think um, taking a step back from a hospital administration standpoint, while this is directly related to COVID caused this, we know that we're not back still over 900 hospitalizations in the state of Georgia for COVID. 17 states are peaking again. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving is next week. Um, we are not a, well, none of us are wearing masks in here, but hopefully many are vaccinated. Um, so we have our own challenges at this state that may spike us again on top of flu coming around. <laughs> so while it may not be COVID, it could be flu, which we've had some pretty bad seasons in the past few years of flu. My recommendation, because we were not able to move forward on a couple of these things, is that the Trauma Commission makes a formal recommendation to the GCC to be able to operationalize this in support of the hospital. So for those of you that are not aware, the GCC was originally the RCC that was created when Grady Health System had the 24-inch pipe that exploded and we got 220 beds. And can you so, just, can you, Michelle, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. Can no, you just okay. say what GCC is and RCC is? Absolutely, because yeah. I say it all the time. So RCC was a regional coordinating center, and now it became the GCC, which is the Georgia Coordinating Center. That was escalated in July of 2020, which is our second COVID spike. As we were seeing, not related to trauma, there was a few traumas, but related to COVID, patients that were in outlying hospitals that were not able to get definitive care, medical care, trauma care, stroke care, because all the hospitals were overwhelmed. We saw that in the second spike, the third spike, down and getting to a baseline after the fourth spike, not knowing if we're going to get a fifth. So 
Um, there's some work to do around this. We, uh, from a state level, we want the hospitals to use the GCC board because if we have another spike, if we have a, a national, hopefully we'll not have hurricanes in December, but if happens and we be able to move patients, this is a great way for folks and hospitals to be able to visualize what is occurring at the state level. I say that because the most recent experience we had besides COVID was when the pipe burst at Grady. And I will tell you, having worked 120 hours in just a few days in that hospital, nobody from a system level had used a state level coordination event. And, and we, there was lots of confusion. And so if we can go ahead in real time on a day-to-day -day basis, be able to utilize this board and the information that comes in there, I think for our trauma patients, which the end goal is definitive care, um, and I certainly don't want you three tag because we took a lot of this. We took a number, and I'm sure you've taken some from other places. Um, but there's some work to be done, and so I would just recommend that we make a formal recommendation for a request, whether it's a subcommittee, not a subcommittee, but a, a working group, or or whether it's just a request of the GCC for what we think we need from a trauma system standpoint for the state of Georgia, um, because we already have it in place. We just need to maximize it. I think that's good. So is, would you recommend, and then we have a work group, or um, I don't know that we need a because we kind of know what we want already. It may just be a couple of meetings. Um, so maybe it is a work group around just a few meetings. And quickly, because December is right around the corner, and any of us in the hospital know January through March is brutal yeah. for all of us, and trauma volume has not abated at all across the state. So I think that we are in a, a tight spot, and we've got just a short period of time to be able to create what we need. And so, David and Kelly, I think you guys probably could help us with that. Yeah, and this has already been discussed by the GCC Advisory Board, and it's on its way. But it, was, it wasn't just an instant thing that could be, could be done. It is in the GCC Advisory Board right now. And it does trauma. It'll, it'll, it'll up here. David. Type because it, it's needed across the bay. There, even we heard it during COVID, it's, I can't find anywhere to put patients non-trauma patients. So that's in the works. One of the things we're trying to be careful of is we don't want EMS to get confused. Sure. That, okay, this says inner facility. If they don't see the inner facility, they just see trauma diversion. Well, I was gonna say, that was our problem for us. We never went on diversion, but there were no options to select- Trauma transfer for transfer diversion. And so, some of our ECC folks who were in charge of updating it put us on diversion. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, no, we're not on diversion. They were like, but it says you're on diversion. Like, because that's, that's the only choice. And that's yeah, what we Talking to our EM, the, the EMS community, the, the, the concern that, we have, that that was added as an inner facility trauma transfer diversion or whatever that wording would be, it would, what the medic would see very quickly is trauma diversion. And we didn't want them to see that it was just a transfer. So what we're looking at is, can there be one view that hospitals can want to see, but it's slightly different than the view that the public can see. Oh, right. So just to make sure that that's clear and not causing David, yeah, it's, it's issues like that. How do we communicate our concerns from a trauma community to the advisory board for the GCC? That's kind of what I think Michelle was getting at. Yeah, so you can just send that to me or to Rachel Barnard. She's the GCC liaison. She will, she will send that to the GCC advisory board for them to review. We want to send an official, an official letter. Yeah. Okay. So do what, Michelle? I do think there needs to just be an official point. I mean, we, this was a work. This was a ad hoc emergent meeting that came up. Right. So I think just to follow to ensure we're following paths. Um, that to we kind of close the loop on that. Yeah. Correct. So that there is an informal request. Um, ideally, we would put somewhat of a deadline. I know that we're working on the systems, but I think we could probably get something in place rather quickly and communicate with EMS what that would mean so that we have the ability, should we spike again, and these spikes come very quickly, um, that we have something in place to mitigate that, particularly for those of you that are in, um, that do not have any other trauma centers. Right. So it's more when, not if. It's, 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 it's going to happen. Yeah, because our ICUs are still, we're still holding. We're still holding ICUs. Every day, even yeah. though COVID numbers, it's yeah. not going to go away. So just to add a wrinkle here, <laughs> You're good at wrinkles, aren't you? I, I am. I am. I, I live in a different world. Uh, so I've got a, let's say I've got a kid that got a gunshot wound to the chest, and I think he needs his chest too, so he won't drown on the way to Augusta. 
So I took him to our hospital. And now he gets high, hung up. Oh, well, we're trying to figure out who can take him, who will take him. Oh, you just send him to Atlanta. That, that's not going to happen real quick. Um, is he so at your he, hospital or is he in the field? He would be at my hospital. hospital. Okay, so, so here's, here's the deal. Our hospital is going to say, hey, don't bring him here because it's going to take us a whole bunch of hell to get him transferred. I mean, in talent, it's not gone away. And if it's, if it's a crucial transfer, Intel is still there. Uh, and I don't know if you can undo Intel or not. I think you can. Well, I, Intel, I, I, if you're well, on but, the version, though, Courtney, Intel doesn't, yeah, I mean, it doesn't apply. You have to have capacity and you have to have capability. If, if, you don't, if you're not on the version, then Intel applies. Yeah, right. that, that, that term is an interesting term. I, I really don't get a definition when I read the Intel laws about that. I mean, I think nobody would want to go to court to try to figure that out or have the CMS come in and talk. And I don't, even, I don't even go down that road. I'm, I'm just going down the road to, to someone in rural Georgia mm -hmm. who needs emergent care. Mm -hmm. And I get it. If you can't handle it, then we need to know somewhere else to, to do it. I, I just want to make sure that you can't handle it. Or like, like, you, like you said, I think coming up with a process by which in our region, because Courtney's in our region, if they're, at, you know, somebody has to be open to take uh, yeah. the kid because they can't, the kid's not, you know, they have capable care, but the kid's not going to survive or, you know, he's got a better chance of survival, which is why they want to get him out or not wait, making eight phone calls, trying to figure out where to get this unstable kid and they're panicking out of their emergency room and come up with a mechanism by which it's a round robin. We're all in, the ba in a bad situation. So we'll, We'll come off while you go on, you know. And That's what we're trying to work out for. We're trying to make sure so that, that all three of us don't go down at once, you know, right. even though none of us are good. And, and, in, and from where I'm at, if that works for those three hospitals, because quite frankly, I'm in the middle of nowhere, but I'm almost equal distance from three level one centers and one level two. So, so on one hand, I'm in good shape. The other hand, no damn matter what you do, you're still an hour and 15 minutes right. in the back of an ambulance. Mm -hmm. So, so that becomes a huge issue. Mm -hmm. So, what my point is that if the hospital thinks that if you bring them to get emergent care in a hospital, all of a sudden now they can't get the patient out, then then you're going to see a push to EMS. Yeah, well, you just take them on anyway. They may live, they may die. I think and, this is actually to open up access because right so, now you're being told no and we have data to support that Gina and I have seen the cases where length of stays and getting patients out are, are just it's horrific it's just it's right. disturbing to look at to be honest we want to mitigate that by having you have a pop-off valve to say if you can't go here it might be a little extended time for transfer if you have to go somewhere you normally don't go but at least you know that and at least you have a place to go. And to formalize the conversations, because you all are already having them. We have them with A and C all the time. It yeah. happened last week. Like they were dying, we were dying. Like they're like, can you hold on for two more hours? We can clear out and then you all can go on. So I think what it does, and having been an ER nurse in a very small hospital, I know that panic when you're just trying to get people out. Um, this would give you a really good visual cue of don't even bother calling, you know, Augusta and Macon. Just go ahead and go send them over. I just don't know. The side of Georgia, but where, yeah, smell. I mean, so then you would just call the other, you would call Savannah. So it would save you some time and hopefully a little stress on your team because that is very stressful when you've got a sick patient in front of you and you yeah. cannot send them anywhere. You know that you don't have the resources. So ideally, this would help mitigate that if we can get this going. I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate here because I'm I'm from a level one center and and we're responsible for a large catchment area, and so we never want to go on diversion because then there's nobody else, right? But the whole premise of a trauma system and a level one trauma center is you're different than other hospitals because you have the resources, the manpower, the 24 hour OR availability to take those sick people. But when, if you don't have those resources, you're no longer a level one. If you don't have any ORs because they're full, if you don't have any place to put that sick patient and your trauma team is scattered here and another taking care of 16 people, you don't have the same resources as you had when you were classified yourself as a level one. So those, that's the time we're talking about. That's the situation we're talking about. Not that, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. We really don't want to get out of bed and, and see that patient. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, we have nobody else on the bench to, to resuscitate that patient. 
I get it. Yeah, I get it. So, I'm sorry, yeah. Dr. Vance. Are you thinking about this uh, aspect of central notification? You have to have a central clearinghouse of knowing who has space and capacity uh, at any given time versus kind of having it more uh, kind of with the programs themselves. My concern is that uh, uh, I'm sure that there are not minute to minute, hour to hour updates to that information. Maybe a Today in some places, uh, uh, at, at before we even start to rely on that information to be the up-to-date, accurate information about who has capacity at any given minute, uh, I would almost rather have a system where the directors at each of the centers could communicate in on real time. I would maybe formalize what, what you were talking about earlier, Genesis. You get a call at three in the morning or something. We got these calls in Northeast Georgia from Alabama. Uh, saying that we called 100 places. We can't get the to take this patient. We need to take it. Yep. Uh, and, you know, if I get that call, I'm gonna, I, have, you know, I have reasonable capacity. I'm going to say yes. But I also know that that patient's got to travel you know, five, six hours to where I am before they go by several other level one centers. And so I want to make sure that. that that that's accurate information as well. And so right now, what I mean, when I get that call at two in the morning, right now I just have to trust them that they've actually made those calls. Because if they haven't, they're in danger of that patient. I have no way of knowing. I have no way of knowing if uh, they've called, you know, in Florida, if they've called the U.S. Uh, or maybe they just call me they can all say yes, I don't know them yeah, right now, I just don't know. So I, I, I would be concerned that the information that we're getting from the central control system is not going to be accurate. That's a good point. Get up yeah, the, if they're supposed, supposed to <laughs> update every two to four hours and anytime there is a status change. So if you have to, if you need to go on total or trauma or medical or whatever it is that you have, you're supposed to update the system. Quite honestly, it's actually gotten, it has um, through the COVID process, when we're surging in COVID, it was really good for a lot of centers. There were some that never updated. So absolutely, I don't disagree with you at all. I think there's some work to be done around that. Um, but for the hospitals that are using it, it is pretty timely. Like you pretty much know, well, but not everybody's using it yet. Good thing from the promise standpoint, we're not, we're not advocating for every hour and for me i'm only i only want to know about two people <laughs> i really don't care where you're on a version or not but i'm not going to send you a you see what i mean or, or grady well maybe no, grady so every we get over <laughs> but so specialist but 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 i really want to know about my my home team here because if i look and i see both of you all are red and i get that call I'm going to say, no, we're not going on to version. We're going to hang in there till one of them go green right. and then we'll tap out. But, but, but I'm also going to follow that up with a text or a call saying, I can't hold on much longer. How you, Jim, yeah. you got to give me, give me, you got to be off in four hours or can you be off in four hours? Right. You see what I mean? And now I don't even have that capability except I have the transfer center call their transfer center and then they do that. And then they call me back and, or I text them. So Texting. this wouldn't fix every problem, having it on the center. And you're right if it's not up there, but it would give me more information than I have now. And then I can do a drill down. If they're both red, I can do a drill down and say, how long are you going to be red? Just like what you did. That was great what y'all did with A and C, saying I can hold on four more hours, you know. Uh, but, that, but your points are well taken. That's good. But we need to not rely on it as the end all be all. It, it's just a starting point in time in my mind. You know, like, because uh, if they're both red, that's going to generate that's going to generate a phone call from me saying how long you're going to be red. You see what I mean? I wouldn't just sit there and go, "Oh, we're red. Life's bad." And then they be going begging, like, "Don't be red long," because I, I can't hold on much longer. I'm getting ready to go red. So, well, and then this brings but that's a good point. The that's point. Okay. Okay. I was going to say with to Michelle that this is where I think bringing the administrators in too, because we have an understanding in text 
but you know, your text to me sets off a cascade of text at my facility, the same thing. But the administrators are bought in on the front end and on the work group side, you know, we met one time and there's tons of engagement. So I think there's the interest in it to say just what you do. I mean, we did it informally, but to formalize it, to agree at that level that you'll stay on when they're you know, on or off right. based on the other availabilities. So there's some availability within a region is gonna help the places like Courtney's place to get a patient somewhere within the, within a closer catchment area, which is the right thing to do. But you know, we can agree to do that, but we've got to get administration to say, yes, we'll hold on you know, for four more hours while they're clearing out. And then you know, they'll help us out while we clear out and, and work together on that. You guys are that more established because you've faced the crisis for a long time now. Yeah. So <laughs> I think the mission here, the, the, we should leave here with everybody on the same page. The mission is to, to answer Courtney's question, is to keep keep somebody open. Okay, so so everybody, because the way it is now, you just say, we're on the verge, you know, just throw it, we're on the verge. Without in a, in a silo, you can do that, and you're not taking into account how that affects everybody else, how that affects your hospital, how that affects your hospital, and so on. So, the, the the mission of our group, I think, to take to the administrators too, I think we're getting far enough along now we can talk intelligently and have a have a plan, is to keep somebody open, to keep somebody open, and uh, so the patients don't have to travel very far, and that's our goal. So, Michelle. Uh, and Liz, why don't you all put together some talking or what we want, talking points, and then let's run that through, uh, I guess, David and the GCC Advisory Board. And then let's see if we can pull it together. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. And there's something else to think about. And, you know, because in a mass casualty, you <coughs> lower your standard of care to so say you go on emergency standard of care or you change your standard of care. Um, in these types of situations, I, I think that's what we're talking about, aren't we? Because we're going on diversion because we don't have the capability or the or the capacity, but but yet we're going to still take people, which I, I totally agree with. We just I think there has to be some coverage there for okay, we're in a we're in a mass casualty situation here, so our standard of care has got to change because yeah. we're not able to provide the same standard of care as we're normally able to. That's something that we need to consider. Absolutely, because an MCI is actually rare and far between because that's a bunch of patients at once. But in reality, in our trauma centers, we could get seven bad MVAs with three to four patients and that equals a, just a one MCI event. And it's not looked at that way. Right. I think the other thing, and Liz and I talked about this a couple of times, is I think from a hospital perspective, um, the trauma commission, us, and I'm not sure what this looks like, you know, is it staffing the reason why they can't take patients or is it because of capacity? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I know we don't close beds. I mean, we are doing all, we got twice a day staffing huddles, all kinds of things that we're doing to keep beds open. But reality is the nursing workforce is in 35% um, uh, vacancy rate in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us, I mean, almost all of us are using travelers. So I think that that's where the administrative group is going to come in because we need to understand that um, a little bit from a, from a Georgia's trauma system issue, not just our regions. Um, but everybody, because reality is, is if people are shutting down, they are going to be shifted to other regions, uh, which then impacts families and everything else and have to travel farther. So sure. I think that we have, to, that is a piece through COVID that we would be remiss if we did not take a step back and look at what that impact has been on the hospital system, because it's going to impact trauma at the end of the day. Good discussion. Yeah, good discussion. Yeah, good discussion. Okay, we need to move on. Yeah, just a few. Um, every the rest of the information is in your packet. I just want to say that we're wrapping up the um, level three, level four readiness cost survey. That has been a fantastic exercise, and I really look forward to getting that information so we can see what level we're funded at. Um, you all know about our Clark's Christmas Kids. Uh, project. And then we have our um, meeting dates for next year. I don't necessarily think we need to approve those because they're the same meeting dates they've been for 10 years. So okay. That's um, if you all are good, we can just move on to the next section. I just uh, close with saying congratulations to Michelle on her permanent appointment as a chief nurse executive for Grady Health System. That's very exciting and they're very lucky to have you. Okay, we'll move into the uh, 
injury prevention subcommittee work, well, the work groups, but first one is injury prevention. John? So uh, for the report out, it's going to be a little different for injury prevention today. Uh, in, uh, in past meetings, it was intended to have uh, Dr. Daniel Wu present the Cardiff, Cardiff model for uh, violence mitigation. He is the uh, <laughs> He is the uh, interim chief of emergency medicine and the chief medical information officer at uh, Grady Health System and uh, associate professor of emergency medicine at uh, Emory. And he is uh, a national leader for the Cardiff model here in the United States. And I think it would be important for all of us to be educated on this so that we have a means of implementing it. And, Take it away, Dr. Wu. And I would like to second the congratulations to uh, Michelle first, and I'm very, very happy to be here. So, um, good morning, and um, thank you, Dr. for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, thank you for the introduction. I know I have plenty of time, and you're very busy, so I'm going to continue forward and be fast. My, my wife says I want to speak too fast, and sometimes it's, it's a skill that I need to so <laughs> use today. So, but if, if I, if I uh, I'm unclear, please stop me. I think it's a very important program and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to bring it forward to you all. Um, but I want to make sure that um, you fully, fully present it in the right manner. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about or have questions, please stop me. So the objectives for today, really quick, are to tell you about the Cardiff program. Um, I know some of the people at Cardiff uh, know Cardiff really well and some don't. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a quick summary of what the Cardiff is. The history behind it, what we've done in the United States, what we're doing in Atlanta, and what we'd like to do in Georgia. At the very end, I would ask for your questions and do. So the, the presentation is here, um, and, it, it, and I'll, I'll tell you the slides to go along with. But the first one is this map. I want to show you. I'm going to start with that. And some of you may recognize this. This is John Snow's map of London and so on. Not John Snow, the game of thrones of John Snow, but John Snow, the OBGYN anesthesiologist in 1854. Who identified the cause of cholera. And in 1854, they were having a cholera outbreak. John Snow said, and they, at the time they thought it was due to vapors. John says, no, I think it's water. And what he did is he took hospital data, public uh, available data, and mapped every single cholera incident around a well, the Broad Street well. He then took that information and he took it to public officials and the clergy and said, we've got to do something about it. And he petitioned them to have to take a hand with the well off. The moment they did that, cholera case. There are 600 deaths in that one area, and then a few weeks later, it was completely gone. And then years later, we identified what cholera was. And John Snow is widely recognized as the father of epidemiology in the world today. That goes on to the next slide, which shows the socioeconomic, uh, socio-ecological model of public health, and specifically violence. And this is what uh, CDC uses. And as you can see, there are a lot of things that go into someone's risk of violence or their longevity. Personal issues, relationships, community, and society. And in the next slide, Cardiff focuses on the community aspect. What's happening in the community? We know there's maps out there that show you that your life expectancy is determined by your zip code plus four. It changes place to place because where you live and what you have access to and who you deal with and what you're in, and your risk of violence matters and it, it, it impacts your life expectancy. And that's what Cardiff is all about. So on the next slide, we, we fast forward from John Snow 150 years, and there's a visionary named Dr. Jonathan Shepard, who's an oral maxillary facial surgeon in Cardiff, Wales, who's with Cardiff University. And he was sick and tired of getting called down in the middle of the night and someone people up. And he said, this is ridiculous. I saw them up, they go out, they come back in again, I do it again. So he, he did something very simple. He said, I'm going to collect anonymous patient data on these injuries. And what he did is he took, he had his registrars collect, not their name, just the location of the, of the violence, the, the time of the violence and what happened. He then began to share it with police and his community and they developed better maps. And then they did interventions based on that data. And a few things they discovered. One is when the police in Cardiff thought violence was going down, they added the Cardiff data, hospital data, and violence was going up. The most famous intervention they did was they realized that so many unknown cases were coming from bars, because that's where the water holes were in, in Cardiff. And people go to bars, they would get in a fight, they break their bottles and their glasses and use that as weapons. 
and they'd cut each other off. And so they went to the bar owners and said, this is your constituents, this is your issue, it's happening on your property, what do you want to do? To the community itself, they just gave them the data. And the bar owners said, we're going to pass an ordinance, and we're going to make all glass in, in bars throughout our area. Meaning if it, if it breaks, it shatters. It could no longer be used in the They did things like finding out that certain construction sites were not, uh, they didn't, they didn't, um, they didn't secure all the construction materials at night. They wanted the city to pass an ordinance that happened. The CDC was so impressed that they came over and did an analysis and they did sister cities. They took six sister cities part of it and said, your violence and your injuries are the same. And they mapped it with cardiac interventions. What they found is when the sister cities violence was going up in injuries, cardiac was going down. So much so that they had it be organized and, and, and find new sister cities for part It was so impactful that in the United Kingdom, these partnerships are now mandated. You have to do it. It's by government law. What partnership was that? That was fascinating. The, the Cardiff, Cardiff Injury Prevention. So they have to, and who has to participate? Hospitals, uh, law enforcement, public health. Wow, really? Yes. Okay. In addition, the CDC went over and said, okay, it's <laughs> worthwhile. I'm going to acknowledge that. And what they found, and I'm going to leave this, uh, just a little here. Handouts. This is from the CDC, the poster. It actually has the information on their toolkit. And they actually have the, the, the cost benefit analysis on the website as well. So, what they found is for every dollar spent, they converted some pounds uh, on the party program, $34 in healthcare and justice system costs were saved. When they went into life expectancy, loss of job, it was one to 84 pounds. Significant, significant. So that's what Cardiff is in a nutshell. It is cross-sectoral partnerships using hospital data, combining it with public data and doing community level intervention. And it works. So much so, the CDC came over and said, let's see if we can do this in the United States. In 2015, they came to um, Atlanta and the University of Pennsylvania. And they said, can you guys replicate this? Can you collect data in, uh, from, from uh, your, your patient and share it with the police? That's all they asked us to do. We did it agree. So that's the next slide. And from 2015 to 2015, for 18 months, we screened every single patient. Or we tried to screen every patient from DVD. We screened 150,000 patients for violent injuries. All we asked them were, were you injured? And it wasn't intentional. <coughs> then we collected the dates, we screened and the time and location. That's it. Then we mapped it against the data that was known to the <coughs> in our local area. In 80, to 90% of all injuries that came in agreed during that period of time were not known to law enforcement. 80 to 90%. The Department of Justice um, estimates that, that violence is 50% is under. We had 80 to 90% in the lab. And we published our data in the And that's the map. This is just a map of the area. It looks like John Snow's time, doesn't it? All we're taking is hospital data, public health data, and combining them. And we're getting a different picture. So from that, we, um, we established United States Injury Prevention Program in Atlanta. Uh, in addition, the CDC, uh, from our work in uh, University of Pennsylvania and the other major implementation in the United States, which, which is in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, developed part of all the And it's on the CDC website, CDC website, and it's located here. In addition, we developed uh, a little bit of a, a, a summary of our work in the United States Injury Prevention Program. And there's a QR code if you want to get to the CDC website. And this has all the information on all the tools and how a technical and analysis pattern of uh, human card implementation. So the next slide is just an overview. Oh, sorry, this slide is the, our current partnership. Um, it involves the CDC, the Capital Department, City of Atlanta, Grady, uh, ASCO, which is the Association of State Territorial Health Officials across the United States, and um, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. In the center is the Department of Public Health. And I want to stress that and I put them in the center for a reason. It's because they are the natural honest broker to get this data from all the hospitals and law enforcement. We share data with them anyway. When there's STD, we send it to them. When there's dog bite, we send it to them. But all this stuff is going to them anyway. And they've agreed to house reports. So currently they're housing our current data and they're going to help us treat the maps. The next slide is just a brief overview of the CDC's view of Cardiff and the current um, uh, studies are going on from a public health, hospital, law enforcement focus. I just want to focus on the center 
Um, that's what we're doing here with the Interest Center at Emory and at Brady. And that, um, but it's not. And so what we decided to do is, in order to go to better ground, crime doesn't stop at one county or another county. We realize that. People, you know, criminals or violence doesn't say, oh, this is the city of Atlanta, I gotta go, I'm not gonna go outside of there, right? We need to build a better map all across. And so we developed a national network. I'm the co-chair with Dr. Jenny uh, Hernandez-Meyer from Medical College, Wisconsin. And we have 15 cities who are participating. who are either implementing projects or interested in implementing projects in the list district. And we're providing technical analysis to all the cities. There's currently two in Georgia, um, which leads me to my ask in the next uh, offer is that we want to expand this. We want to bring this ideally to the United States all over. If you can think about it, we don't know where we need to get to because we don't know a starting point. We really don't know what, how much violence is out there. And, and I'm sure all of you used a, a map system to get here somewhere, right? You rely on it. You certainly wouldn't, it, it, that's complete data. That's instantaneous data. You're pulling data from anyone driving in that direction on exactly how fast you can go. We need better data. And that's what Carter does. It's not a complete answer, but it's certainly a better picture than what we have now. So what we're doing with um, a study in Georgia, and this is based, uh, this is funded by the CDC through the Interest Center at Emory, is we want to see if we can expand part of it, not piece by piece, not hospital by hospital, but through an entire trauma network. And so what we'd like to do is we're using um, implementation science, science, which is CFER. It's, a, it's the um, solid framework for implementation research. We want to develop a way to expand this rapidly. The trauma systems are the natural partners. It is, it is as, a, as a trauma hospital, it's, that's what we, we do. We care for these people. Um, and, and that's our mission. And, and if you look at violence, violence is always one of the top three, top four in any trauma system. It's always up there as one of the, 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 uh, the highest volume. So our aims are to identify existing barriers for trauma hospitals and law enforcement to implement part of it. And all, all we're asking is we're gonna do virtual interviews with stakeholders <coughs> to see if trauma systems in, in Georgia, how close they are to being able to implement part of it rapidly. And we're, at the very end of the study, we're gonna give those trauma hospitals their evaluation. So if they choose to implement progress, they have a, 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 a blueprint ready to go, and we will provide them technical assistance through the net, national network and the um, The outcomes we're trying to get to are, uh, can we do this rapidly through state system? Um, we're also going to use this information to make the CDC uh, toolkit uh, more updated. I think there'll be a lot of uh, scholarship opportunities but just also, this, this, is, this is what we do. And there are very few violence prevention programs or evidence based in this one. I'd be happy to take any questions. Just out of curiosity, what data goes into the CARTA? Anybody that was a victim of assault? Any intentional, yes, any intentional violence. And what goes in is uh, no personal identifiers. Uh, their, their location happened, the time it happened, and then the description of like, what mechanism was used. Was it a, a, a knife, a gun, two assailants, things like that. And there's already an EPIC template for collection of this yes. data, is that correct? Yeah, so it could be deployed through, I'm sure EPIC now warehouses that. So if you have a repository for this data, how do you identify a champion to make an intervention. And it's one thing to have the data, it's another thing to do something about the data. That's a great question. And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna take Dr. Jonathan Shepard is, is still kind of our guide mentor. He comes in and talks to us and gives us the interaction. And if, and if you were here today, he'd say, you know, the hospital, that's great, involvement, the law enforcement, we need it, public health, we need it, but it's a community. It's a community of partnerships that really change things. And when we implemented this in the Cap County, we had politicians come in and say, wait, 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 this hot spot in Utah, we're not coming into your house telling you what to do. We're coming with you as a partner saying, this is the information. You tell us what's the best thing to do for And what we did in the Cap County is we did a, a, I think it's called a, a, a 
windshield drive by. Well, I, I, I'm sure you have the terminology wrong, wrong word. We just got to a police car, we just drove around the area. And we started asking people, what's going on? We went to abandoned buildings, we went to gas stations that had been lighted. And the community was right, I mean, they, they were telling us exactly what's going on. And then we invited them in and said, okay, what do you want? If you need, if you need, this is what's happening. It's happening at this other gas station. Now you tell us why. And that's what he did at Carter. He said, we're not telling you what to do. We're telling you where these violence, violence is occurring. That's fact. Now you tell us the best way for this to occur. And I think the benefits of Carter go beyond just violence prevention. You bring communities closer to the law You bring public communities closer, especially in this time where there's been a lot of distrust. Everyone's at the table together when we use partnerships making decisions together. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Fantastic. Well, we'd love to have all of your systems participating. My information is on the back. Um, if, if you're interested, we'd love to have a sit down with, with whoever at your institution um, or the key stakeholders, and we'll make the time to, to give them more information. No commitment, but it, it is, it'll just be virtual interviews, and then you get a, a, a product readiness evaluation at the end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. Good work. Great report, John. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was fascinating. That was very, very fascinating. Okay, we'll move into uh, bylaws work group. Dr. Wallace. Yes, hopefully we are finished with this one. Um, so you have in your packet the requested revisions. Um, there are a couple more that came up for this other conversation that I would also like to make a motion at, or when we move forward to make a motion for um, removal. Um, one of those is under Article 5D, the ballot process. And then under um, Article 6, meetings, um, taking away um, two thirds and just having majority versus two thirds for just regular commission business. Those were two different breakouts. Um, so any conversation or request as they stand right now with those two amendments? So I'd like to make a motion um, to accept them with the corrected changes, including the two um, striking the ballot and then changing um, two thirds to single majority. For regular commission. For re yes, yeah, for regular commission business. Just that one. I apologize. That was like a secretarial error on my part when I changed all the commission members present at a meeting where quorum is determined. I just pasted the two thirds language. It's all the way through. So we don't need two thirds for regular. <laughs> So it's coming from a, well, I guess it's a work group. So I guess technically we do need a motion. So do we have a motion? Motion, yes. That's so good. So who first? Michelle. Michelle, 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 Michelle made the motion. For the minute, and then uh, Courtney for the uh, second. Any discussion? Any nays? Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is on there. Any nays? I don't hear any. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, we will uh, move into the uh, budget subcommittee, Dr. Medeiros. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate that. The budget subcommittee has been meeting on a regular basis. They hate me for that, but I think it's proven very effective to get our processes in place. Um, we only have your reports in the packet, so I won't go into detail uh, about the background activities we're working on. You're welcome to take a look and read that, but I do have two things to bring forth to the commission for consideration today. First is the consideration of approval for the one-time readiness grants that are awarded to the participating designated centers that are currently not funded. Is that a correct way to put it? And I believe there are- They're funds. not contracted, yes. Yes, they're currently not contracted. Uh, these are from amended funds from last year. Uh, there was a grant process and application that went out to these centers. They submitted their proposed uh, expenditure plan. The budget subcommittee has reviewed each of them and has approved them. Uh, they are also in your packet and uh, we would like to 
to approve and move forward with these grants for these centers. Okay. We have a minute to look, those of you that aren't on the budget, so if we need to take a quick look at them. They're after our report. You can see who's participating and what the dollar amounts are and what the items are that they are requesting or uh, services they're asking to support. Are there any questions about the proposals that were submitted? Yeah, and, um, on behalf of the Budget Subcommittee, I'd like to make a proposal amendment. I'm going to forget how you call it to um, for approval of these grants. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, again, I'll just take nays with our colleagues on the Zoom. Any nays? Have to give everybody time to come off mute. So. Mm -hmm. All right, motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. The centers appreciate that. Uh, and it is pretty exciting. I think it's nice because we also, as a result of the way that this is structured, have a list of things that will that the commission was able to assist in putting in centers uh, to help provide care for trauma victims in Georgia. So it's a tangible thing too. All right, the next thing um, that we would like to bring forth for consideration and approval, this came from the um, Rural Subcommittee uh, and TCAA put out a special offer for participation at all levels, all the way down to level fours. And they requested that we provide a one-time grant to allow all the level three and four trauma centers to become Trauma Center Association of America members. Um, this would be a one-time grant. This would not be an ongoing support. Uh, useful and you know the cost-benefit ratio of maintaining that membership. TCA has a tremendous number of resources, and it's a great network. It is trauma-specific. Uh, they lobby heavily in support of the activation fees, the accommodation code fees. Um, they're currently looking at a, a appropriations for Mission Zero. So they're very active at the federal level. And they also provide a lot of consultation resources for trauma centers. We've used them. We're currently engaged with them on, on our, we're revising our finance project because we had a big turnover and educating our finance team on what is the 681 revenue code? How do you use it? What does type five mean um, on the bill? So, if, you know, and they've given us a tremendous amount of time so that we see a lot of value in that. So when this came forth from the rural subcommittee, I thought this was a great idea. We brought it forth to the budget subcommittee and they did support it as a one-time uh, assistance to them. And so we would like to bring that forward as a recommendation for approval from the full commission to do that. They'll pay and then we'll reimburse them once we get proof of payment. Okay, any discussion? Yeah, the handout you see, they reduced the rate and they it was due by November 1st, but I worked with them to get an extension because they knew our process and they were, they were willing to wait. So. I think it supports 3111 102 and that we're making sure that the trauma commission is the pair of last resort. So each center will get to have their one on one consultation with TCA from a finance perspective to figure out if they're realizing all their revenue potentials. I think I'd be great for them to have some financial support. They don't, the smaller hospitals don't always have that, that financial <coughs> support, you know, to, to analyze what they're doing. So yeah. we could actually make that a PDP piece for them next year because their membership will cover that year to say they need to have that finance one-on-one -on -one consultation. I think that's great, yes. Yeah, some, because some of these level four hospitals don't even know what TCA has to offer. Mm -hmm. So I think that would, if we can just educate Put them a little bit. that the grant requirement yeah. that 
there's certain things that they're required to access. It'll help them see the value. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, sounds good. All right. Uh, all any nays for that motion about PCAA? Only Dr. Smith. Just Dr. Smith. Yeah. I, I'm just hanging around to say yay to everything, but if you're only taking nays, I'll stay quiet. <laughs> well, it's good to hear your angelic voice, Jay. Yeah. So thank you for chiming in. Maybe I should take, maybe I should take yays. Okay. All right, motion passes. Thanks. All right, great. Um, I will make one comment and then I have a final motion. Um, some final work from the but uh, the we, the grants and contracts work group, which Dr. Smith is on. There's still work ongoing for that. It's a huge culture shift in what we're trying to achieve. We are putting together some documents. We're gonna to have to do a lot of education for um, everybody that we provide funding for, either through contracts or grants. We, we're asking them to do what we're familiar with, which is zero-based budgeting, to come up with a budget to submit for what they need. And then the budget subcommittee will be reviewing that and allocating dollars as they align with the strategic plan and initiatives for the commission. Uh, just a comment that we're still working on that. It's a big undertaking for us. And we're trying to figure out, you know, the best way for us to kind of socialize that within the group because it's going to be very different from what people are looking at. So it will be coming. It's not going to be anything we're going to roll out instantaneously or, or cause stress. I think it's particularly important as we move into having a trust fund because um, then the potential will be there to have more dollars and we need to be very judicious and and how we allocate those dollars and aligned with our vision and mission. So that was the comment I wanted to make. My final um, request for the full commission, uh, the budget subcommittee, as I said, does meet monthly uh, to stay on top of things. And we always look at expense to budget reports that are contained in the consent agenda so we can kind of see where we are with things. Um, again, this year due to COVID, we'll probably have some funds that we can move around. And the budget subcommittee would like for the full commission to consider supporting um, the budget. So I had to write it down so I'd say it right. Allow the budget subcommittee to move funds as needed among initiatives previously approved by the trauma commission. So we would not be allowed to expend dollars on new things, but we are asking to be able to move funds within the already approved initiatives if we have extra funds that we're not going to spend. And a good example is um, leading control training things. We already have a contract in place. We can purchase more tourniquets, things like that. It's a mission we've already, initiative we've already approved. Um, so we can do that. The budget subcommittee would discuss it and approve it. We would have it in our report so you would know about it. But sometimes because we only meet four times a year, we need to be expeditious. And so we'd like to be able to do that without coming before the full trauma commission. To give you an example, some of those items, it's like end of the year, if um, some initiatives can't be deployed, but say um, we need, like last year, we moved money for stop the bleed equipment. We moved money for AVLS purchase. So unfortunately, Katie finds herself on a short leash in terms of when they will allow her to unencumber and re-encumber funds. So if it's something new, of course, as Dr. Medeiros indicated, we would all have to vote on it. But if it's things where we already fund and we can make best use of funds, we, we don't want to send back a cent, right? Mm -hmm. Katie, she sniffs out the pennies and knows what's there. The beans. And so we're accumulating now to support the budget subcommittee um, a list of things as we go through the year that we can reallocate in buckets. And so I think we just don't want to get ourselves in that situation again this right. year where we have to wait and ask you, can we buy some extremities for stop the bleed equipment and things like that? And we're, we're doing it proactively. So we'll have items that we know we already have contracts with to be able to quickly deploy funds to. And it's stuff that the commission's already supported. Okay. Is this something that the chairman, you loot the chairman in with, or you wouldn't even be talking to him about it? It's on the budget subcommittee. So yes, he's a, he would be aware as well. Sounds good. And oftentimes in the past, Dr. Smith, if you're not familiar, uh, Georgia Trauma Commission had one of the better budgets in the state and because we only turn, we always turn back less than $5,000, which was remarkable. And they said that we had one of the tightest budgets, one of the best budgets 
uh, that were uh, ran through DPH. But this will even make it better for, uh, for this group uh, to be able to do that. Makes sense. Okay, any further discussion? I'll take uh, only nay votes. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> we got to hear it. We got to hear your voice. So. Okay, motion carries. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes our report. Okay. All right, we'll move it into the EMS subcommittee report. Not, not a whole lot of action in the last few meetings. We have been having discussions. Uh, we have been working fairly strictly on the uh, learning management system. That's kind of changed uh, directions a little bit. So we're looking at a, perhaps a different mechanism of, of providing those classes. Uh, and we're still studying on that. I'm, tr I'm trying to get some information from some other folks. EMS training is going on across the state. <coughs> that has gotten down to kind of a work of art. Uh, so that even back to COVID was tough, they got that training done. So uh, we're dealing with, with our fiscal accountability. Uh, right at the moment, we're kind of at a point waiting for the next budget cycle to start working on that. Uh, take any questions or comments. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Okay, we have a break built in this morning, so why don't we take a 10 minute break? Uh, we'll reconvene at 10 35. And uh, the chairman is occupied, so we're going to proceed down the agenda here. Uh, why don't we go ahead and start with the uh, the GCTE subcommittee report? All right, thanks, Dr. Dunn, um, Jesse Gibson from the GCTE subcommittee report. Uh, lots of good work going on between our we have sub subcommittee, so we have injury prevention, registry, um, performance improvement, and uh, pediatrics and education and all those subcommittees have remained very active virtually, obviously throughout the whole um, COVID pandemic, but we're extremely excited. We're gonna have our first in-person meeting tomorrow down here. So um, not expecting a huge in-person turnout, but we wanted to at least open open the doors and, and hopefully start um, getting that you know back on track because we all, as you all said earlier, the in-person meetings are, are much more valuable. Obviously, we'll have a hybrid uh, option for those, or a virtual option for those not there. Um, so what, you have your reports in front of you. I won't read everything, but probably my number one priority right now for the group is setting goals. And we've talked about that at the last couple of commission meetings, but we are going to take the opportunity tomorrow, since we will have some folks in person, to use that uh, time to sort of brainstorm and finalize the goals that we set forth for the next two to four years. Uh, and what we're doing with that work is trying to align with a lot of the other work going on um, throughout the trauma, the state trauma system. So hopefully we will confirm those tomorrow. Um, next thing that we're really trying to do is create some succession planning on our subcommittees. Uh, we have a lot of turnover in the trauma system. So we, we are trying to make sure that every subcommittee of GCTE has a co-chair or someone uh, in line to take over um, if, if there's a, um, a leave by the subcommittee chair. So that's been very, um, that's moving forward and, and seems to be going well. As far as the work being done by all the subcommittees, I, you have a long report from the injury prevention group. They are probably our most active and I'm not going to go through each thing, but they have several different task force that make up their um, injury prevention subcommittee. One of the big things they're doing with the falls prevention group is they're um, implementing a new program called Bingo Size. It's a falls prevention um, program that Crystal and that team have really worked hard to deploy and just kind of getting started with it. So hopefully we'll have some feedback to give you all um, as, as it unfolds. Um, also other things with the other groups, the registry team, uh, they've stayed busy. As, as I said last time, they submitted changes um, to V5 for 2022 updates. We got feedback, we received feedback back from um, DIV5 and uh, some of those things are going to go through, some are not, but we are now waiting on some training so that we can all be up to speed on how we can submit data to the um, image trend site by the uh, Office of EMS and Trauma and DPH. So that's 
that's what that group has been up to. Pediatrics is still working on the pediatric radiology project that you all are very familiar with. Um, they've done some um, deployments through the Georgia Hospital Association to ensure that all um, stakeholders have access to that information and to the pediatric imaging guidelines. Um, they're still working on collecting data so that we can decide kind of where to go from there. Um, secondly, from that group, they are working on, um, I mentioned this last time, but they are really working on their shock index pediatric adjusted or SIPA project. They're doing a trial to determine if that is going to be a valuable um, tool to sort of deploy, educate on and deploy statewide for the pediatric population. And that's really all I have. The other subcommittees, as I said, have been busy and active, but as far as key initiatives, that's all I wanted to share with you guys. Any questions? Just a question on, on the pediatric radiation um, project. I, I thought that was uh, already accomplished and, and moved on. We instituted those guidelines almost a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Are we still struggling with trying to get those guidelines instituted statewide or? I think the, they, they instituted the guidelines, but I think now it's more of the data collection and what are we seeing as a result of the implementation okay, of those so, guidelines. Okay. And, and probably some of the non-trauma centers are where they're having, um, you know, I, I know all the trauma centers de definitely uh, took hold of that, but I think the non-trauma centers sure. are probably a little slower. Especially if you don't see kids on a regular basis, it's, right. you tend to fall into the adult, you know, mindset. Right. Okay, great. Yes, ma'am. Where do you guys plan to present or publish the- uh, That project? The, the uh, pediatric, the radiation impact, the radiation they've study. already published some, I think. Yeah, they? but uh, right, the data you're collecting now to see the re actual ask. reduction, because it'll be not only a reduction in radiation exposure to children, but it would be a cost savings for uh, as well. Right, I'll ask that question tomorrow. We'll get back with you, because I absolutely think you're right. It needs to be published. I think it's a great talk to you. Sorry, two clips about pediatric. Radiation food? Yeah. Right. Just a quick one, just to augment what you said, and that is uh, that there's a lot of excitement about investigating this pediatric adjusted shock index because what, uh, what the pediatric world is finding is that because children have such a reserve physiologically, that shock in children is becoming recognized and, and therefore getting a tool validated to, well, it already has been validated really, but implementing it so that we prevent children from falling way over the edge uh, as far as going into shock before it's recognized is uh, the reason for this project and there's a lot of excitement about it. Yeah, I think that it's gonna produce a lot of good results because it's, you know, what's a normal heart rate for a six-year-old versus a 10-year-old versus an 18-year-old? It can be challenging for the person who sees two or three kids a year, you know, for sure. And put in a plug for Dr. Smith with you guys. She mm -hmm. she presented at our Region Two RTAC a few months ago on it, and it was a very educational and because it's very new. I don't think you know everyone has heard of this score. So I think right. if, if you guys are willing to continue educating us, I think there's definitely an audience listening. So anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right, I will uh, revert my, uh, yeah. I will take the, turn it over back to Dr. Ashley again. Yeah. So we're, we're just about at new business, so we're just about ready to, cook. Okay. yeah, we're just about ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's Dr. Patterson. Yep. Yeah, so right. Greg, I see your picture. You, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you, there Dr. Ed. Thank you, Dr. Ashley, for allowing us a couple of minutes to uh, present our subcommittee on the rural level three and level four trauma centers in Georgia. Uh, you've got our report, I think, in your packet, as you see there, just a few things to uh, present. Um, I think uh, several things that have been going on and are very dynamic for us, and I think will help a, a lot in the, the rural level threes and fours in the state. First thing, uh, we've, we've uh, developed our cost of care survey, which has been distributed and uh, is currently being collected. I think we've had collections and a lot of data submission uh, almost, almost complete at this point. It's currently in the validation and analysis process by a um, Warren Abert uh, organization. And hopefully we'll have something out to be some preliminary data to share with you personally uh, by the end of the year. 
Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to formalize this in a report at the meeting in uh, February um, or end of March, excuse me, the end of February, 1st of March. Um, the ACS consult consultative visit process that we were trying to emulate for level four, since there's not a technical consult process for the level fours, we had proposed uh, and ultimately have engaged the Pennsylvania Trauma System Foundation since they have a level four system that they use for accreditation. We have um, uh, set this up with the Pennsylvania Trauma Foundation, uh, confirmed dates, uh, and ultimately this will be confirmed by the end of the year. Uh, we plan to set this up for the week of October 10th through the 14th to handle all the level four centers in Georgia uh, next year. And hopefully we'll have a formalized report about this time of their findings on the consultative visits uh, at that point. Um, the other thing, we've, we're still ongoing with work with uh, grants and capital equipment in rural education. I know that Courtney probably has more to share with this, but there are ongoing work with forced development for trauma providers in the pre-hospital and hospital settings at all available hospitals that want to participate. Um, I think the meeting has been set for February 1st and 2nd to be uh, handled up at Lake Blackshear uh, somewhere. And they're working on finalizing, I think, this course and ultimately how it can dovetail in as kind of a if you will, mini ATLS type class. I know we've heard talk of the March pause process in the past. I'll let Courtney say anything else about that. Um, only other thing really I wanted to talk about was the um, access to specialty care. We're currently re-engaging the trauma medical directors and administrative group on this process. If you look down at section eight, uh, our transfer issue problems that we had, we had come up with a resource tool that's been completed, distributed to all the level threes and fours. So they have current working phone numbers, email addresses, who offers what services across the state and who to get in touch with. And hopefully we'll be able to update that on a yearly basis. I did also want to mention and thank the committee for uh, the consideration of um, the, TC, the, the TCAA uh, membership for level threes and fours which I think y'all are voting on today uh, to provide resources for both finances, operations, and networking with the trauma centers in Georgia. And uh, we do appreciate that. That's all I really have to report, Dr. Ashman. Well, Dr. Patterson, that was a great report and we did a uh, vote on that already and approved it. So thank you. And then, then sincerely, thank you for us. I really do appreciate that. We just really appreciate what you guys are doing, you and uh, Dr. Register and the whole, the whole uh, level three and level four committees there. Uh, it's it's really been energized us, I think, to get to get you guys involved, and I think you have a home now, and uh, that will improve support for the level threes and level fours and all the rural hospitals. So. Thank you, and I do I do thank Dr. Register. I don't think she could be here today, and then all the all the committee that's working with us. I do appreciate them all. It's been a quite an effort. I know you carved out time from your office. I know you're seeing patients, so uh, yes, sir. Uh, we try to get you in there at the appropriate time. With sometimes I do. we run. A I do appreciate it. Though. It's been great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. We'll move into the trauma administrator subcommittee, Dr. Wallace, but I think we sort of we talked a lot. We <laughs> did. I think the big couple of things. One, I think I know for myself um, and probably many of my colleagues with COVID hit, our, our, our process and everything shifted towards operations. Um, and so after our August meeting um, that occurred virtually with some in person, um, I think Simon, uh, there was a request for care. <laughs> And uh, we only received a couple. And um, uh, unfortunately, fortunately, they were all nursing related. So I do believe that um, when I meet with the group is that we would like to have a backup and we would prefer that we have finance business as well, i.e. for Grady, I would like for my CFO to be a part of this as well, just because they bring a different, we bring operations, they bring finance and business. And I think the collaboration of the two um, would bring a lot of value, particularly as we are moving forward with some of the things we need to look at from a commission standpoint. Um, so I do believe that that is probably our next big step um, related to membership. Um, we will have two in-person and two virtual meetings in 2022. The first in-person with no virtual option, 
is going to be at Barnsley in March. Um, and Liz has so graciously figured out work through magic, um, a finance workshop uh, for the administrators group. Um, I know until I started, uh, so Liz and I started working together many moons ago, that was not something that was in our wheelhouse. It's not something that we normally do. And so we want to ensure that our hospital administrator group CFOs understand the, the process and the caveats behind um, trauma dollars. Yes, sir. Uh, will the CFOs be referred to be attend that meeting now? No, it's it one person. So it's a person and or your designee. So okay. that was framed the same way as with TMD and all the other pieces. So this Great. will not be both. Um, but I do believe that I just, having been a part of this in some form or fashion over the last few years, that's been our biggest gap and being able to bring that, um, that business strength will be very valuable. Um, so that is really where we stand is getting our co-chair, so level two, threes, and fours, um, and, um, uh, waiting for <coughs> hitting our meeting in March, which we will have finance workshop and then we have designated work time. So if there are other items that need to come forward to the administrative group, please just send them to me so we can work through those um, and have them on the agenda. That's it, Mr. Chair, thank you. Great report. Thanks. I think it's a good idea too to have them involved, especially if we, as we, that group's gonna be very important as if we work on a, a sustainable funding source, the groundwork now, they need to, they need to learn to work together on this particular topic and be educated and bring it into finance fees. All there's all that will need to be already in, in place before we do that. Yes, sir. So, so this is important. Okay. All right, Dr. Dunn, the trauma systems metrics and data work group report. Yes, we've had a uh, we recently just had a meeting, and uh, with the help of uh, Gina Solomon and the state, uh, they were able to, to drill down. The goal of the work group, obviously, for those of you who don't know, is to try to find um, how to improve the, uh, the time to care metric, right? And what is that time to care metric? When somebody's in a ditch in rural Georgia, how long does it take to get them to, to a definitive care? Um, and the data is kind of all over the place, but what was encouraging from our last meeting is we have access to every step of that piece. We have access to the time from EMS pick the ditch to the time they go to the rural hospital, how long they spend at the rural hospital, how long it takes EMS to come pick them up to the definitive care hospital. So we have all those bits of data. Now what we're realizing is there's holes uh, in that data or there's incomplete data. So the sample size is super small. So it's hard to make any definitive conclusions based on that. So I think uh, Liz, one of Liz's um, recommendations was to go back to the GCTE, the PI group, um, and, uh, and try to help them fill in some of those holes for the data for the registry uh, as far as with the, the e, uh, EMS times and the arrival times um, from that. But I, I, I really shout out goes out to Gina Solomon and, and the state. They were able to drill down into specific patient records and to get actual times. I was very, very encouraged because I've never seen a report that actually had times or data from each of those subgroups. Uh, it's easy to get it from the, the level ones or the level twos or the level threes. Sometimes it's easy to get the EMS reports going to the level twos, level threes, or level ones, but never from you know the the, uh, the critical access hospitals. So um, I think there's still some more work to be done, but we're getting closer. It's it's a painstaking process for sure, but I, I think the uh, the only result is going to be absolutely gold once we get it for sure. Um, Gina, do you have anything more to say on that? And uh, Liz. No, it's just kind I of mean, a the drill downs between Marie and Renee uh, are, is just their wealth of knowledge. You know, the devils are in the details, sure. right, to try to figure out what our opportunities are. So there actually was a great presentation at Tinkle about, you know, a, a system that's looked at their time to transfers and how they improve that. Um, and I think there's some potential to really make an impact there. <laughs> no, not Jim, other abstract. Right. Yeah, I know, that's right, exactly. Um, and then also the GCTE, we want to talk, uh, maybe punt it over to PI to mill around the threshold for um, scene time uh, for review of cases, like whether that's 20 minutes and anything over, you put them in the buckets, if it's extrication or whatever. That's something we can't control. So we should probably 
come up with a recommendation from GCTE to set that, and then everybody agree that's what they're going to look at. And, and to, discuss with, to discuss with EMS about what is an appropriate team time, you know, for in rural Georgia in region nine, we've set it at 10 minutes. If you're penetrating trauma patients, yeah, EMS has 10 minutes on the scene to get them back in the back of the truck. It's no longer stay in play, it's scoop and run. And so, but you know, for the car crash victim, how long is, what's a reasonable time? How long is too long? So I think we still have some work to do on that for sure. And that's really all I have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. We'll move into the uh, system partner reports. First up is Georgia Trauma Foundation, Dr. Bleacher. So I'm going to start the Trauma Foundation report by reintroducing you to Cheryl Ward, Cheryl Mayer. She is our interim executive director. And over the past few months, we uh, have renewed our focus on the goals that the foundation should always have had, and that is to raise money to fund projects that are meaningful to improving trauma <coughs> in Georgia. We understand that there has been some concern that the foundation has been supported, but hasn't really delivered. And so we are refocusing on a multi-pronged approach to philanthropy and diverse revenue streams. Board should be between nine and 13 people. We're currently at three. So we've got an active slate of potential board members with diverse background, including business, healthcare, and consulting, and such. And we are reviewing the, uh, the folders on those. We're in the vetting process. So we're reviewing the folders for those to make offers for additional board members and also <coughs> the board start thinking about succession plans because Eugene and I are running out the clock here. <laughs> uh, you'll also notice that uh, that there's fundraising initiatives that are going into place such as uh, next April we will be doing the uh, Porsche experience again as a fundraiser the gala so more more on that to come but the, the date is april the 30th and uh, i think as far as uh, the the fundraising goes we're, we're also creating networks of people that are uh, people of influence uh, so we, we call it friend raising uh, in addition to fundraising. So networking with people who know people who can be contributing to the foundation in a variety of ways, uh, that's all in the works as well. Uh, we've made contact with Deloitte about ways that they may be able to help the foundation. So we are very focused on the goals that the foundation it's always needed to have and, and we are renewing our commitment. Chair, do you have any comments that you'd like to add or? No, I mean, I think you did a really good job, but one of the things that I, I, I guess just want to follow up um, on with you is that um, as far as raising money, we are really looking at um, doing a diversification of our revenue streams. And John mentioned a couple of things that we're looking to do as far as bringing in money through special events and fundraisers and fundraisers. But we're also going to be uh, going uh, after corporate dollars um, as much as we can. So it was great that you mentioned the chamber and its support for the commission because we can pursue some of those relationships. And we're going to be looking at bringing in funding through uh, grants. We're going to do some different things at some of the trauma meetings around the state. In the past, we haven't really done any fundraising there. So we'll be focusing on uh, that as an avenue. And then we'll be doing some peer-to-peer -peer fundraising as well, where we've got advocates in the community in various areas around the state who, who will raise money on our behalf. 
so we're excited about things to come and we'll be keeping you all in the loop and, and uh, encouraging you to participate as much as you can. It is very exciting. I'm really looking forward to the portion that we're going to wear. Yeah, we've got some different things coming up. So mark your calendars, April 30th. Okay. That concludes the report that John Okay, uh, Gina, the Georgia Quality Improvement Program update. Um, official reports in your packet, but just we had a lot of good work being done in the subgroups, the AKI, the TBI, and the opioid uh, work groups. Um, the opioid, we actually have a draft of multimodal um, guideline uh, that um, is coming together very nicely. AKI, we're looking at the um, prevention guidelines that were done many years ago and kind of revamping um, those. So we have a subgroup of that and we've got an ISS prediction subproject that's also in development um, with, with that. Um, and we had a, a poster on our AKI work um, that was done by our research resident, Dr. Jesse Todner, that was presented at TQA um, with that work. And the TBI group, we want to do a, an additional data pool if we can to kind of broaden um, the data that, that we have. And we're looking to pull together maybe some TBI inpatient rehab resources that we can share. And that's proven to be a lot more challenging than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> so we're going to continue to see if there's some avenues um, with that. Um, the benchmarking platform and data central site, um, the security assessments are, are still in progress for one completed for the other. Um, they, they, what we have has been sent to the AG's office for them to review. Um, the bill is going to take about 21 weeks after we get the contract <laughs> signed with the entity. So it, it's kind of slow for going, but it's it's going there. Um, the peer protection and data uh, use policies, we have started meetings with the um, AG's office and the special counsel regarding that. And we start um, bi-weekly meetings next Monday um, with them to continue to work on that. And just from the NISQIP side, um, they're doing some great things. They're actually um, sharing some of their data like we've done with trauma. So they share their SAR deciles for the first time. Um, and we reviewed them like we do our performance metrics for, for trauma, and they have a winter meeting in, coming up in uh, January at Augusta uh, from that. So, and I, uh, I know Dr. Ashley mentioned our, our change in, in leadership. Um, Dr. Dente has, has certainly done a lot and brought us this, this far, but I, I look forward to the next chapter with Dr. Todd and, and some of the other folks who may be willing to, to come along and give us some direction. All I got, unless there's some questions. Very good. Very exciting time. And thanks for your, you know, it's been sort of a heavy lift at first. I know it's been hard, but uh, you've done a good job. I appreciate it. And it's good. It's, it's starting, exciting. When I get some data, more. I'll be really excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you're building the car now. It'll be fun to take it out for a test yes, drive soon, but you're getting, you're getting close. <laughs> He's puppy. <laughs> you're getting close. Okay. Thanks, Gina. All right, uh, Office of EMS and Trauma Update. David or Renee? Yeah. Or both? <laughs> um, you have your report in the packet there. Um, we, as Liz mentioned, uh, it's, it's very exciting that Cartersville received their ACS verification as the first level three. Uh, I was there for the visit and it was it was a great visit a um, lot of information exchanged and that john had done a good job there getting ready for it um emmanuel has successfully redesignated uh, so we've done those um, and then we have a new uh well star paulding is a new level four uh, they're in the big city of Hiram, Georgia. <laughs> uh, I have to admit, it'd been quite a while since I've been to that neck of the woods, and uh, it was uh, it has grown quite a bit. Uh, they have a new facility there, and actually, they built the new one about five years ago, and two years later, added about thirty more beds. So that's a big outsource of Atlanta now. It's getting very, very busy. Uh, so we were excited to have them come on. And they came in with the expectation that very soon they'll go to a three. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, hospital was that? Uh, Paulding, Wellstar Paulding. They're in Hiram. They're up, up past Six Flags. Just keep going. Okay. <laughs> it's the best way I can explain. Um, but we have uh, the, the um, 
ACS has started to send out appointments for um, their visits to take start taking up again. So uh, I'm finalizing some things with them, but it seems they're going to be kicking off in February with some of their uh, site visits for redesignations and I mean reverifications and um, the um, catching up on those that had had their um, their consultative visits, but not their verification visits. Um, and I think that's about all for now. Uh, we're still in need of some reviewers. Um, if anybody's interested to let me know, um, you know, I, I have quite a few for the higher levels, but it's the small levels that I have trouble uh, finding, you know, the level threes and stuff. If Dr. Patterson is still on. I'm probably, I think I mentioned it to him several times, but the, the holidays and other activities have, have been pretty hefty and everybody's now starting to catch up and all from COVID, but now the holidays are here. So our schedules are conflicted again. So uh, we're probably gonna be really busy after the first of the year, but um, it does appear that things are on track. I've done several tabletops with some of the centers um, that are, you know, sort of in that gap area, but everybody seems to be committed. We've had a lot of turnover in facilities. We've had a lot of name changes. Uh, I emailed the new updated list to Liz and Gabby this morning. I failed to send it to her the other day, so my apologies, but um, that's the updated list with everybody that we have on it. So, any questions? Uh, Renee, are you, I know that college is still doing virtual site visits. They are. Verification is, uh, what is the state doing? Well, we, we've talked about it. Our biggest issue is uh, we don't quite have the, I guess, the security level or the technology for the record review. Uh -huh. uh, but we've come up with some alternatives possibly to having at least an on-site just for the chart review, but doing the other virtual. Um, it, it's just a difficult time to kind of get some of those things going. But um, it, you know, we're, we're eventually going to have to have a better plan of how those will take place. And we're, we're discussing it and working on it. But currently you're doing it in person? Yeah, the ones are still in person. And they've been fine so far. We've really practiced very well about distancing. The hospitals have been good about, you know, how we are set up and, and all for that. I mean, Courtney can tell you, I think we did really well that day on his. We were spread out pretty good. And, but two, I, I think everybody that participated in mid vaccinated and, you know, that kind of stuff. So we're, sure. we're still very cautious but it just depends on where the facility is, where the hot spot is. Right. Yeah, exactly. So but that's kind of where we are. And thank you all for your recent concerns and prayers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Did you back to it? Did you click for one second? Um, you want to talk about the schedule at Thornsley? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you have it as a <laughs> you sort of finalize this. <laughs> It's a little bit of work in progress. Yes, so we'll um, but I, we wanted to share kind of our, our working schedule for the Barnston meeting, um, our winter meeting. It'll be February 28th, March 1st, um, and March 2nd. I know Michelle mentioned already a little bit that uh, Liz has secured a, a, a mini finance workshop for the administrators that morning. Um, and I'm really excited. I, I mean, the, the venue is absolutely fantastic. Um, I think it will lend itself to this much needed um, collaborative work that COVID has kind of taken away from us, you know, with not being in the same room. Um, so right now we are not going to offer any virtual. Um, we want to bring folks back together um, and, and do that brainstorming and, and group work that seems to be so productive that you miss on Zoom. It, you just don't get the same um, outcome. Um, and you miss those little backhaul conversations that start things like GQIP. <laughs> you know, it, they, they have to occur. People have to meet and, and network. So we're really excited um, about that. So you, you, this is our working agenda right now. I'm, I'm excited about the things that, that we have planned and put together and happy to answer any questions. I have a question just uh, tied into what Michelle was saying too. The administrators group finance workshop. Just tell me exactly sort of what mm -hmm. we're trying to do there because I want to make sure I've got the right my folks. I know who's my champion at the hospital now, administrative champion. Uh, that's been assigned and they're very enthusiastic, very good person. So uh, I want to see if I need my CFO there too or. Yeah, so we're working with TCAA because we want to do a little pre-work before this because we want to see where everybody is. Um, 
Is everybody charging activation fee? You know, we don't want to know what you're charging. We just want to know, are you doing it? If not, are you aware of it? Uh, there's lots of documentation pieces that you need to support. And if you're not doing it, how you kind of negotiate where you are in your third party negotiation piece, how that plays into it. Because just because you're just because you're not in that place, you need to get there because you need to start charging in order for your your prospective uh, payments to increase. So, um, so we're I'm working with them to put together. And Michelle, you and I will touch base on this. We're going to try to put together a little survey monkey, like just basic, not anything hard, but just to get where they are. And then also, we really like to include the trauma program managers and trauma medical directors because I think everybody hearing it, I don't want to make TCAA's mind blow up because sometimes they get a little funny about their workshops and stuff. But um, it's nice for everybody to hear the same thing and okay. understand it. Um, so it will really be up to the center who they think is the best person. Now, if it's someone that just counts beans but has no idea how that works into the process, it might it might not work great if it's, you know, but it, it just, it's just really going to depend. So we can put that messaging out to the administrators to say, you know, we're, we're willing to have a conversation with you to figure out who might be the best person. But um, we kind of came up with this idea that Jesse actually suggested, could the TPMs and TMDs be involved in it? And um, I think that's a great idea. Michelle thought it was a great idea. So, um, so they can come to that meeting? Yeah, well, I'm working on uh, with them right now. Um, the speaker that they have is fantastic. She has a ton of experience and works with some really high level groups on setting costs and things like that. So, you know, TCA, they've got some powerful connections. So I think it will really, it will really benefit us. And then I think that will set us up for St. Simon's could be part 2.0. Okay, first you told us what you lacked. Now we gave everybody the information. Where's your barriers for your, you know, we, we kind of need to to do that and then hopefully we can kind of wrap it up and then we from that point on just do kind of an update sort of thing um, is there a limited number of uh, room size capacity for people to come i mean i it's obviously pricey i know but because uh, i'm thinking as you're talking about it your cfo probably isn't the right person it's definitely your administrator but we, you know, since I was mentioning we're working with TCA currently now, there are some revenue cycle people who um, are meeting with us that need to understand this process because they're, they're coders for reimbursement right. and you have facility right. fees and pro fees. And one of the biggest things that I'm struggling with, I was going to mention to you to be sure they cover, is I have a lot of pushback on facility critical care charges because the mindset is on the pro fee and you need 30 minutes and the physician has to document it and we're like no <laughs> you don't it you know and how you write your policies and stuff i'm guessing there's probably going to be similar issues in centers that aren't doing it um to to put the right code you know you have to have the 992 99291 and they they don't they're reluctant to put it because they don't see the physician charge for it, but facility charges are different than professional charges. And having somebody explain that, well, if you don't have somebody in your revenue code, you know, your revenue cycle process hearing that, then when it you know comes down to those people, you know, you don't have to have your coders there, but somebody at the higher level who's going to push this information out to make sure that you're capturing your charges correctly, because they'll take the code, they'll scrub it, they'll take the code up when it was appropriate to the charge. It. I think it's going to be dependent upon each institution deciding who is that best person. Mm -hmm. More people. Is there a limit? Is there like think about that space? Well, this space, I, I will just say the space is limited. Okay, so oh, it is. so Cheryl, yeah. Gina, and myself are working with the contract that we have. It's what we have. Okay, it's what we're moving forward with. It's paid for. It's it's committed. So this is like a symposium type meeting. This is just, which I think will probably actually, this will be a good opportunity for us. This is all the system leader type folks together kind of working through some of this stuff, which is why you'll see the way sort of the schedule's designed. So unfortunately, yeah, we won't have a lot of, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. It's a little, it's a little over what we try to set the threshold with, um, you know, staying around the similar rates to what we got with, um, 
uh, St. Simon or St. Simon's and Chateau, um, you know, but this is a little bit more, but it's a little bit unique opportunity. We'll see if it's not a good fit, if we do not have to do it again in the future. But um, I think with all this sort of networking time worked in, I think sometimes we get so busy, um, you know, and we tried to make the meeting schedule work the best that we could to get everybody in and out. And I know everybody's time is, it's, it's very difficult to try to get away from your institution. So uh, that's what we're going with. I think it's very valuable, though, to help the administrators get a context for what the charges really mean. And that's why I think it's imperative that the, either the medical director or the program director is there to help set the stage or to, to flush out what, what we're really talking about. You know, like that's a the great example is the critical care charge. You can have a critical care patient, but not charge to critical care and it's just it gets complicated very very quickly and it's it's just better to have experts on both sides the finance and the clinical side in, at the same table discussing it and then they've now made that connection and they can they're hearing the same information and then they can go back and do their really detailed work at their institution to your point about the revenue and the coders and stuff we can probably set up a separate webinar to get yeah. it to trickle down to those other people who need to hear it especially in the big more complex organizations where they need a little bit more directives about how to accomplish that. Yeah, I was asking because I knew that the, this capacity space was tight wise. So trying to flesh out sort of what the content's going to be and then how many people from, from each institution can you accommodate? So if you say, okay, no more than three per institution, because you're going to have your TMD, your program manager or director and then somebody from finance and you can kind of say okay who's my best and i know that you can't answer that today it's something you're gonna have to work out when you work through it but it just got the wheels going of like people's faces popped in my head it's like when you have to decide who's the right person that kind of thing but yeah i think it's going to be a, a a beginning of something that can, will grow because of, what is it eight, two and a half hours. There's no way they can cover everything. So it's more of a wet your appetite. And the other thing, like Dr. Dunn mentioned, I think it's going to be a great opportunity to connect somebody from the finance. I mean, I there's probably places where the trauma medical director and the finance people don't ever speak to each other. And that's not good. So this will be another opportunity to kind of bridge those gaps to hear the same thing at the same time. And then they can take it back to their institution and maybe a follow-up survey. To say, you know, now that you've been exposed to this, sort of what additional information you need, kind of thing. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, having worked through that sort of PB208 code, you know, you start, you've got to get the right people <laughs> at the front end, like your administrators, to kind of start asking the questions. And then that puts you with those people that you're, you wind up working with, the coders and all, you know. Um, so I think this is a great jumping off spot and, and the survey afterwards, like what, what else do you need? Who, who do you, who are you going to take this back to and have these conversations with? Because some of them may go, do we even, do we have that? Do we have a UB208 <laughs> code for a trauma career repair charge? I mean, I don't even know that, you know, but at least it'll start the conversation. So I think it's. Fantastic. And I can tell you, Tracy Johns tried to implement what you did at Northeast Georgia with the critical care. Oh my gosh, the amount of work that went into just getting that set up was fun. I mean, and if I think if uh, the right people, the finance, which may not be the right people, but then the, the revenue cycle people, yeah, the coders were involved, revenue cycle. it was, I mean, there was just so much, uh, they didn't have any clue as to what that was or how to make it work. And then they were nervous about it. So, so I, coming to the table to learn from the national people will be very helpful. Yeah. So I, I think this is everywhere. I think it's like that. We need to bring all the great minds together. Mm -hmm. so. And I got lucky to have a great finance person mm -hmm. that worked with me on that project and knew who to pull in, you know, because that's the key thing too, you right. know, to be able to answer those good questions. Yeah. So. so we were still able to give time for administrators breakout in the afternoon during all the other breakouts because TCA, when I said, well, we need a little bit of time with that group, they were like, we only have two and a half, but there's a lot of information for two and a half hours and people are going to have questions. So we need to give at least 30 minutes to the Q&A. So somehow it all worked out. 
Um, and I think we just need to get it in our heads. This is almost like our retreat to really get together, dig in, um, and maybe set the strategy for, uh, we'll have the readiness costs for threes and fours, and then maybe that's our jump off point to start attacking the funding formulas and is what we have right, or do we need to um, get people in a room, as you always say, with pencils for eight hours and lots of ad blowing. Um, and I just want to say one thing too, and uh, the end of your report, and I'm sorry I didn't speak up earlier, I just remembered it, that um, in the folks who've reached out to me on the heels of that presentation, and just talking about us, not even at the point of doing case reviews with the AG peer review policies yet, but just unveiling our odds ratios together and our outlier stats, people are floored. Remember when we first yeah. did that and how like- it's two years to result. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we don't realize how far we've come. We are talking about our dirty laundry. It's helping us all get better. And it's like, it's sometimes you only, you know, Gina and I were a little disheartened when we got our fall report because it wasn't what we expected, but we're working on it. And it, again, it is a work in progress, um, just small, you know, small incremental progress, but we've come so far. Just so Liz, I don't know if you all, and this may not, I know some of this correlates to CQIP, CQIP data, but there have been multiple um, HSPs, DC, multiple institutions have put out the data around our hacks and highs through mm -hmm. COVID and how they've yes. gone in the opposite direction. So I don't know if you've seen that. It's yeah. eye opening yeah. yes. to see that because it's not just medical. I mean, it's trauma, it's staffing, it's lots yeah. of other things that get oh, impacted. Yeah. Yeah, sure. so I just we looked at that before. We're all going in. Our As you're saying that your fault, the fall report wasn't what you wanted. The Georgia report, that. you yeah. know, collaborative. It's not. It's not as good as it was. And if you look, then they started tracking COVID. Yeah. And we're like. All, all others, all other hospitals, yeah. like 1.97%. Twice. We're at like three or four. We're twice as high COVID patients mm -hmm. in our Georgia report as other states wow. or as other hospitals. Yeah. And it's reflected in our morbidity and our mortality. Mm -hmm. and, and I think okay. it'll really be interesting that this will be a great project is to dissect those odds ratios and, and everything from each center based on that fall report. And then try to pull together, like, can we link what were the challenges? I mean, people had staff redeployed, you know, those kind of things. And, you know, how did that drive those, you know? It appears it's an association. To use to, you know, it yeah. appears, that's not proven, but it appears that COVID affected our trauma outcomes, you know, based on that report. But again, that's not, that's just. Yeah, but we'll have to dig in, and that's, that'll be. That's also something administrators would really like mm -hmm. to see. We could show that, that is report, our yeah. outcomes, it's our reportable data. You know, I think from a, from a system level, I think that's something that maybe is put something prepared by March. Um, I don't know if that's what it's Yeah, about. no, I, I think we can definitely, you know, I team folks up to get those performance matrix from the February, from that, that fall report. And, and then, you know, although we share blanket, you know, the fact that centers are, you know, comfortable sharing with me. And then, you know, everybody can come at, they, they know where they're at, compare themselves, you know, and find those people that are willing to say, yes, we are struggling. Yes, yes, that's us right there. We're struggling with that. And how did you, this person who's number, you know, decile number one, how did you manage this during that time? And, and be able to pull that out. That's the ultimate goal. You could show the administrators, but they probably ought to see the report you gave yesterday about how before, we started doing data, we were outliers, we started working together, the whole state came down. Okay, so buy into quality, you know, we've proven it works. And now when COVID hit, it's coming back up. We took, you know, because our state is, you know, only about 40% here, I think, are vaccinated. So, you know, does that have something to do with it? I mean, compared to some of these other places. So, but for whatever the reason is, we took a hit. And, and our COVID patients are twice as much as others. So I think the administrators need to see that because they have to deal with COVID. It's affecting our trauma. So anyway, that's a, that would be a good thing. Good report. Okay. Any new business? Uh, anything we've left out? No new business was submitted. Okay. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Can I make a motion? Second. <laughs> Seconded. <laughs> Jay, you're still oh, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of the Lord. Jay, you're still here.
wish you, you I, I wish you would show your video, you know, but all the scene all day is J. Smith. Okay. <laughs> it's not pretty. <laughs>